The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, July 19th, 2022, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our presenter, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Welcome, Jim. Thanks for having me. Today, Jim covers the persistent inversion of the yield curve. At the time of this recording, the two-year, 10-year curve is negative 21. What are the different yield curves that the market watches? Yeah, so there's an infinite amount of yield curves, and I guess if you search wide and low, you're going to find somebody in the market that follows some yield curve, no matter how archaic it is. But let's talk about the big major ones. If we go to the first chart, the big one, which traders like to follow, is the difference between the two-year and the 10-year yield. So the two-year yield is on top in orange, and the 10-year yield is in the top in green. And you can see that the orange line has recently gone above the green line. So the short-term interest rate is higher than the long-term interest rate. The bottom chart shows you the difference between the two. And as of July 5th, it had gone below zero or inverted. And as of <coughs> yesterday's close, we're recording on the 19th. So the July 18th, we've had 10 consecutive days where the curve has been inverted. So that's a big one that people look at. The next curve, that looks gets a lot of uh, attention is the difference between the 10 year again and the three month bill. This is more referred to as the economist curve. Most of curves, most economists that have done studies on the yield curves impact on the um, uh, on the financial markets or on the economy. Uh, Cameron Harvey famously did a study in the 1980s at the University of Chicago. He's now professor at Duke. Uh, they focus on looking at something like the 10-year note and the three-month bill, which is a proxy for the funds rate. Now, this curve is not inverted, but boy, if you look at this curve, it is really flattening quite a bit. In the last eight trading days, it has gone July 8th. It was uh, The difference between the three-month bill and the 10-year was 120 basis points, 1.2%. Today, it's 55, eight days later. That is a 65 basis point <coughs> flattening in just eight trading days. Now, a lot of that is anticipation that the Fed next week is going to raise rates 75 basis points. And then they're probably not going to be done if the market anticipation is correct. There'll be another similar type move in September. But this curve is really heading towards zero and potentially inverting very quickly. And then the last chart we'll look at are some short-term curves. So there is the two-year note, three-month the two-year note minus the three-month bill yield in blue. And then there's this ugly thing called the implied forward six quarters ahead three-month bill less the three-year note. Forward rate curves, you can, as I've always said, what is a forward rate curve? I can look at what the two-year yield is today. I can look at what the one-year yield is today and figure out that if I get, if I get all that income in one year, what one-year yield do I need in one year to equal the two-year yield today? That's what the forward curve attempts to do. What this ugly orange thing is, is that it says, what will be the six, the three month, will be the three month yield in six quarters or 18 months. And that's what that projects minus the current three month bill yield today. Why are we looking at this? Because the Fed has done a number of papers and a lot of Fed governors have cited, this is their holy grail yield curve that tells them um, about the economy. And I overlay it with the more traditional, easier to understand difference between the two-year yield and the three-month yield. And you can see they're pretty similar to each other. You know, one kind of overextends the other and they've really converged on each other. So on the short end of the yield curve, this is another one they look at. So two-year, 10-year, three-month, 10-year, two-year, three-month. So the commonality there is the three-month bill, the two-year note, and the 10-year. These and the differences between those seem to be what a lot of people focus on. And Jim, what is a persistent inversion? 
So if we go to the next chart, um, <clears throat> the next chart well, shows you. So first of all, before I, I talk about the chart, let me explain the word persistent. A lot of people look at the yield curve and they say, well, as soon as it inverts one tenth of one basis point for one minute, that's it. There's your signal. And the answer is usually not because it's not unusual for the curve to go negative. It did on April 1st of this year for one day. And then it uninverted for three months right after that. So what a lot of studies have done, and I've kind of adopted a version of this too, is I want to see the curve go negative and I want to see it stay negative, a persistent inversion. So I had to put a parameter on that. And my parameter on that is, is that it will invert for 10 consecutive days. Now, the two-year, 10-year note did that as of last night's close. It was the 10th consecutive day that it has been inverted. And as you pointed out, it's at minus 21 basis points as we speak. That is the orange line on this chart. The blue line on this chart is the three-month, 10-year curve. Now, what you'll find, and this chart goes all the way back 50 years, uh, in the shaded areas of recessions, what you'll find is that if the two-year, 10-year yield curve persistently inverts, and again, it met that qualification yesterday, then the other curve, the 10-year, three-month curve, will either invert at the same time or will eventually invert. So the fact that the 10-3-month curve is not inverted, history says it will. It's only a matter of time. It could be a couple of weeks, could be a few months, it could be the same day, but it will eventually invert before the cycle is over. If we jump to the next chart, uh, here is the, the, two, the two year, three month curve that I showed before, but a bigger picture of it. And you can see how that thing really rocketed out to almost 200 basis points and, inver and is now quickly heading towards inversion. An inversion on this curve is a signal that the Fed should be cutting rates is what this curve means. It means that, and the reason that the short-term curve like that 18 month or six quarter out, three month bill minus the current three month bill that the Fed likes is what that's telling you is the economy has gotten so bad that the next move is gonna be a cut. And that's why when that curve inverts, you're also very, very close to inversion. Now we're headed that way in a quick hurry um, right now. And it is, it is not quite there suggesting that the Fed should be cutting rates shortly. And if we jump to the final chart in this section, this is a different type of curve altogether. This is the forward rate curve. It's simple. It's just the yield on the Fed fund futures contracts, you know, each month out all the way to the um, middle of 2024. So it just basically tells you every month, August, September, October, all the way to February 24, what does the market think the Fed funds rate will be? It peaks at 3.5% in February, and then that line downslopes through the rest of 23 and into 24. And a lot of people have pointed out that what this forward curve is telling you is the market expects the Fed to be done with its rate hikes sometime early next year, maybe six months away from now, and then somewhere in 23 start cutting rates. The implication there is we're in recession, inflation is past its peak, and we could then start to see the cycle turn the other way. That is a correct interpretation. But there's one thing about this. This is what the market thinks today. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. One year ago, the forward rate curve was telling you that there'd be a grand total of 125 basis point hike for all of 2022. If we get the 75 basis point hike next week, as is expected, we'll have nine done through July. Um, six months ago, maybe not, maybe four months ago, to be more specific, the forward rate curve was suggesting that the Fed would pause rates after a 50 basis point cut by September. Well, they want 75 in, uh, in June. They're probably going to go another 75 in July and probably even a third 75 in September. So the four months ago when the forward curve was projecting a pause, that didn't happen. It's important to understand this forward curve because it's what the market thinks, but don't mistake that with, so therefore it will happen. The market at any moment can change its mind. Maybe this is the path we follow in 23, or maybe in three months or six months, we have a completely different path 
for where forward rates are going to go. So where are we so far with all of this is yield curves are inverting and the forward rate curve is suggesting that there could be rate cuts next year and the two year, three month curve, while it's not quite inverted, which would suggest the same thing, it's a little bit behind the forward curves, but it's getting there quickly. And what does this mean for the economy? So if we go to the final two charts, the second to last chart here, the yield curve, when it does invert, tends to uh, predict a recession. It is eight for eight in predicting recessions. Now, when short rates are above long rates, why does that happen? The Federal Reserve's policy has an enormous influence over short rates. They're raising rates. Rates go up on the short end of the curve. They can't really come down that much because the Fed sets those rates. They're not, they're freely traded, but they've got this heavy, heavy influence from the Federal Reserve. Long rates, on the other hand, are more freely traded. They look around and they say, the Fed's policy is too restrictive. It's going to break something and it's going to cause a recession. So people pile in the long rates and they go down. They go down below sh um, short rates. The curve inverts. It's signaling to us that the Federal Reserve is making a mistake and it will create a recession. Now the curve, as I pointed out, it's not quite there yet, but boy, it's moving there in a quick hurry. So if we go to the final chart or table, the final table just shows you back to 1969, the date that the three month 10 year curve inverted for 10 consecutive days, persistent inversion. And there's the dates in the second column. The date of the recession is in the third column. And the difference is in the fourth column. And you'll notice that the average is about 311 days or roughly nine-ish months or so. So the curve usually inverts around nine months before a recession. Now, what's interesting is earlier this year, in March and in April, when we got that one day inversion, Wall Street was out with a lot of narrative that, oh, the curve might invert, but this time it won't signal a recession. Um, it won't be a leading indicator of a recession. Uh, and then the curve uninverted and that narrative kind of went away. And now that it's inverting again, you've got so many other signals that a recession might be coming that no one's saying it. But I want to go back and say that they might have been right, but in the opposite way, is that the curve might not be leading the recession. It might be coincident with it this time that we might already be in recession um, or we're about to go in recession, that the lead time will be very, very short. Um, on how much the curve could lead the recession. Now, why would that be? Uh, a couple of things. One, there's plenty of that, there's plenty of other indicators of a recession that are out there right now that are flashing yellow or red lights. The biggest one is the high inflation rate. Remember that a recession is real growth. That is after inflation growth. So if you've got nominal or before inflation growth at five or four percent but you have a 6% annualized inflation rate for the quarter, which is what we had, you have negative one for real growth. That is recessionary growth, even though nominal growth is positive. We haven't had that for a long time because we've had such low inflation that the only way you had a recession was you had to have negative real growth. Well, now that we've got real inflation, you don't need negative real growth. So you've got that. The Atlanta Fed GDP is one such measure. GDP was negative 1.6% in the first quarter. Its last update came today, and it's projecting 1.6% for the second quarter, same number. Um, can it be off? Yes. Can it be off by more than 1.6%? Sure, but that's a rare occurrence if it is off by that much. It's rarely off by that much. So you might have two consecutive negative GDP quarters. Now, a lot of people say, well, recession is whatever the National Bureau of Economic Research is business cycle dating committee says is a recession. And that's true. It's whatever the committee decides is a recession. But I'll point out that there's no instance of two negative quarters ever not being in a recession. So if we get a negative quarter this time with the negative quarter in the first quarter for GDP, every other time that's happened, it's been a recession. The stock market has corrected more than 20%, did that on June 16th. Uh, every 20% correction occurs in the middle of a recession. Consumer confidence hit an all-time low in June. Every all-time low is in a recession. Now we've got the yield curve beginning to invert. That is usually a leader of a recession. But after 14 years of QE and a lot of manipulation by the central banks on their interest rates, 
I wouldn't be surprised if the yield curve moves to more of a coincidental indicator relative to a leading indicator because it's not so much as freely traded as it used to be, but it's still a very valuable indicator. So sum it all up. The yield curve is telling us the Fed is too tight. We're going to go into recession. Uh, forward curves are saying, well, the Fed will have to cut rates next year, but, but just because they price it in doesn't mean it happens. Something different can happen as well, too. And you've got plenty of other indicators, Atlanta Fed, GDP, record lows in consumer confidence, 20% correction in the stock market, which are all pointing towards recession. So there's no doubt real growth is getting bright amber, if not red signals, that there is a problem. But here's the rub. Fed's not focused on that. The Fed's focused on inflation. And I have been one on these podcasts and everywhere else saying, I think when the rubber meets the road, the Fed is going to hold the line until they see inflation break. And if that means these red signals that lead to recession actually manifest in the recession, then so be it. A lot of other people have been arguing, no, the Fed will cave and they will start printing money even if we have high inflation because they cannot afford to let real growth flag to the degree that it seems to. That's going to be the debate up front. But for this podcast and our conversation here, the yield curve is yet another amber or red signal coming that there is going to be problems with growth in the economy. That is not in dispute, I don't think. What is the dispute, and we've talked about it before and we'll talk about it again, is the Federal Reserve's resolve to holding hawkish policy in the face of weak growth until inflation falls. I think they will. I understand the argument that they may cave, and we'll just have to wait and see. Jim, thank you for your thoughts today, and thank you everyone for joining us. We are client driven. If you have any questions or feedback, please let us know. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianco Research, and Arbor Data Science, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week.